Prayer is important to us, right? I don't think it's controversial to say that on a Sunday morning in a church. Prayer is important to us. We've gathered here today to do many things. We sing, we share fellowship, we'll share in communion. But more than anything, I think we've gathered here today to pray, to worship. Prayer is essential to what it is to be a Christian. And yet my guess is that most of the people in this room, and definitely including me, most of us have, at least once in life, struggled with prayer. We've struggled to know what we should say or how we ought to pray. So prayer is important, but it's not always easy to know how to actually do it. Now, if you're like me and you've sometimes, once or perhaps more than once, struggled to know how to pray. Don't worry, you're in pretty good company. Jesus' disciples, his hand-picked students today, after they see Jesus praying, they come to him and they say, "Uh, can you teach us how to pray? They also are struggling to find the words to pray. Now, normally, if you ask Jesus a straightforward question, you don't actually get a straightforward answer. Jesus loves to answer questions with more questions, or he'll give you a parable, this simple little story that seems simple at first, but actually turns out to be confusing, and often kind of a trick that Jesus has played on you. But not today. For once, Jesus just answers the question directly. They ask him how to pray, and he simply says, when you pray, and then gives them something they can quote, five short statements. This is how to pray. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Now, most of you, I think, will recognize that this is a version of the Lord's Prayer. It's a simpler version than the one we use, but it's the Lord's Prayer. And many Christians know this prayer by heart from a young age. We will pray it uh, after we've prayed the Eucharistic prayer here today. Many of us use this prayer daily in our own prayer life. It's a short, simple, familial, familiar prayer. And yet there's a lot of depth going on here. And if this is the way we're supposed to pray, if this is the model prayer that Jesus gives us, then I think it would behoove us to pay close attention to what exactly Jesus is saying. Because like a lot of the things that Jesus says, it's short and simple on the surface, but there is a lot going on here. So let's get right to it. Jesus opens the prayer, and it's worth pointing out that These five statements are all requests. They're all requests. Jesus is telling us to ask God for something in each of these five statements. And in being requests, they're all future focused. Prayer is not about the past. It's about the future. Even when we remember the past in prayer, for Jesus at least, prayer is always about the future. It's future focused. Jesus begins... Father, hallowed be your name. This is crucial because Jesus is pointing out that prayer is always addressed to God. God names God here as Father, in Aramaic actually Abba, which is more like Papa or Dad. But here in English, of course, as Episcopalians, we like the more formal Father. Prayer is addressed to God. Now that may seem obvious that prayer has to be addressed to God, But how often have you had the experience of someone who uses prayer more like an announcement to the community that they're praying with, right? I pray that I will do well on my test, which I'm having next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., party to follow afterwards at the local bar. Prayer, though, has to be addressed to God, genuinely addressed to God. And so Jesus does that right out the gate, naming God here. And if we're addressing God, we have to understand our relationship with God, right? And Jesus uses this word, hallowed, a sort of somewhat archaic English word here in the translation. Jesus is saying, God, may your name be holy. Holy. To be holy or to be sacred means to be set apart. 
to be other, to be distant, to be different. Jesus addresses God as dad or papa, which is very familiar, and that the next word out of his mouth is, but actually you're different from us, you're beyond us. God is before us. God transcends us. God is beyond our understanding, beyond our control, beyond our comprehension. So right out the gate, there's a huge depth here. Jesus teaches us we must address God. We must meet God, as it were, face to face in a you-me encounter. To deal with God is to not deal with abstractions, but this relationship. And yet this relationship is marked with transcendence, holiness, difference, otherness, mystery. So Jesus has placed us in the right context to understand what prayer really is. We address God, but when we address God, we address a mystery. This leads us right to the second statement. Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come. And really, this is the essence, not just of the prayer, but of Jesus' whole mission. Jesus' whole reason for his ministry is to help make the kingdom come. Jesus looks at the world, and as a Jewish man, he knows that the world has been made to be good. The world is inherently a good place. And yet Jesus knows, like we all know, that the world falls short of really being as good as it could or should be, right? The world is supposed to be a place of love and compassion, of solidarity and truth, but it's often a place of suffering and hatred and violence and deception. And so God's kingdom needs to come. The world needs to be made what it's supposed to be. That's what Jesus is doing. Everything that Jesus does is about bringing the kingdom to earth, bringing God's truth, God's grace, God's love, God's healing to us. So this is the core of the prayer. God, your kingdom come. Notice it's your kingdom, God's kingdom. Prayer is not a time for us to assert our will on the world, but rather a time for us to seek to harmonize ourselves with God's will. And so Jesus anchors the prayer there. Whatever else we pray for and whatever else we do in our lives of faith, it has to be about welcoming God's healing presence into a broken world. If we're not doing that, then we're not really following Jesus. But the next three requests are all actually focused on us. And indeed, the next request is focused on our material needs. Jesus makes it clear it's okay to pray for material needs. He teaches us to pray. Give us each day our daily bread, the food we need to live. And I think we can also imply here not just food, but water and shelter, the basic necessities that we need to be alive. It's not just okay to pray for those things. We should ask God. But notice, Jesus tells us to pray for our daily bread. He doesn't say you can pray for a sumptuous feast. Still, le still less does Jesus authorize us to pray for a mansion and a Bentley and a private jet and a rich bank account? No. We're asked to pray for our needs, what we need, but not more. Enough, but no more than enough. The other thing to notice here is that Jesus doesn't say, give me my daily bread. In fact, you won't see the words me or I or my or mine in this prayer at all. It's our Father. Our translation here doesn't have the hour, but as we prayed, it's our Father, right? Give us each day our daily bread. When we meet God in that mysterious ground, we don't meet God as an individual. We often think of prayer as an individual act, and indeed, Jesus himself, if you pay attention to the Gospels, Jesus likes to go away to a lonely and deserted place to pray. Jesus likes to pray alone. I think he gets fed up with these disciples who don't seem to get what he's saying most of the time. Jesus likes to pray alone, and yet even when he prays alone, he prays as part of a community. Give us our daily bread. Give us enough, not more than enough, but enough. And of course, part of the implication is, I'll take enough, but no more, so that there's enough for everyone else too a lesson that I think we still struggle to learn. We 
know God as a community of people. We don't know God alone. We know God in and through others. And this lesson continues in the fourth request, right? Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. For, because we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. We ask for forgiveness. We look at the world and we see that it's broken, but we also know that the brokenness isn't just what other people have done. We know that sometimes we break the world a little bit. We do things we shouldn't do. We cause some of the problems in the world. We're probably not the worst, but I think all, all of us will, if we're honest with ourselves, know that we're not the best either. So we ask for forgiveness for the ways that we fall short of who God calls us to be. We ask for forgiveness for the ways we fall short of who we know we need and want to be. But notice that our seeking of forgiveness from God is linked to our ability to forgive others. Again, we approach God, we know God through community, not on our own. And indeed, the suggestion is that we cannot receive God's forgiveness unless we've already been willing to forgive others. God's forgiveness is always there for the taking, but in order to actually reach it, take hold of it, we have to forgive others. I was reading a commentary this week on this passage, and the way that this scholar described it, I really liked. He said, Jesus is teaching us that in our lives, there's one, there's one channel of grace. There's one road or pathway of grace and forgiveness. And if we want God's grace and forgiveness to come down this channel to us, we can't block it off. And if we refuse to give forgiveness to others, we've created an obstacle, a barrier that blocks our forgiveness, our kindness, our grace from going to others. But that same obstacle prevents God's grace and forgiveness from getting to us. It's not that God isn't offering it, but that we are refusing to take it. What we learn then is that our relationship to God is inexorably intertwined with our relationship with other people. I know we'd often prefer that weren't the case, right? It'd be nice to be able to deal with God and not have to deal with all these other people. Jesus does not give us that option. Finally, then, this future-focused prayer ends with Jesus teaching us that it's okay that we pray that things won't be worse than they have to be. Jesus ultimately is, in the long sense, an optimist, right? He prays for the coming of God's kingdom, but Jesus knows better than anyone that the future is not always bright. In the end, it should work out, but between here and the end, things might get really rough. They certainly do for Jesus. And he says that it's okay to not want to suffer in life. We might have to. We might be asked to put ourselves in harm's way to do what's right, but it's okay to not like that, and it's okay to hope that it won't happen. And as I read these words, I'm reminded of Jesus's own life, right? The night that he was arrested, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays to God. God prays to God, asking that he not have to go through with the arrest, the torture, and the crucifixion. Even though Jesus knows that that's what's coming, Jesus, God incarnate, doesn't want to face that trial. It's okay, it's good and proper to not want to suffer. We know that we might have to be willing to, but Jesus here is reminding us that we should never valorize suffering. Suffering is never good on its own. It might be necessary, but it does nothing good for us in and of itself. And so we are allowed, even encouraged, to pray that there will be less suffering in our lives and the lives of all people, never pretending that suffering is itself somehow good. And then the prayer ends as quickly as it began. In the version we use today, we actually kind of add a final little benediction. We want more of a conclusion, a closing remark on the prayer, but Jesus, when he's done, he's done. This is the prayer. Five short statements, five short requests that are future-focused, that are addressed to God, and that are community-focused. This is how Jesus teaches us to pray. Now, I think that we learn something really powerful and important here about prayer. Even if we're not just using the Lord's Prayer, 
even if we're praying in other forms, this still sets the pattern of what prayer is about. And as I was thinking about prayer, I, I thought about how would we apply this to our lives today in the 21st century? That's always the question when we read Scripture. We Christians read Scripture not as a historical document, but as a living document through which the Holy Spirit can still speak to us today if we're listening. And I was reminded of something really unfortunate about our society here in America. Now, the first unfortunate thing is that in this country, it's now become normal to turn on the news and hear about yet another mass shooting. This country, more than any other, experiences these regular mass shootings at schools, at businesses, at all kinds of places. And it's terrible, but it's become routine for a lot of us, right? We barely even think about it anymore. That's bad enough. But something that you've probably noticed is that after a shooting, frequently politicians will go online on Twitter or Facebook, or they'll go on the news, or they'll go to the newspaper. And what do they say? They say, my thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families pretty much verbatim. So much so that that phrase has become a stock cliche phrase. It's kind of lost any meaning anymore. My thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families. And then inevitably, a few minutes later on Twitter, another group of people will come out and attack those politicians, criticize them. And frequently what they say is, we don't need your thoughts and prayers, we need action. If you're a legislator, what we need is for you to pass new laws, do something to prevent the next shooting from happening. And so we get this argument online, and you know, arguments on the internet are always really productive and helpful, right? These two sides, the sort of pro-prayer side and the sort of pro-action side. But this debate, this argument, is built on a false premise. Prayer is not a replacement for action. It is not an excuse to not act. And part of the reason we know this is if we pay attention to Jesus' mode of prayer and his life. Again, his prayer is future-focused. We are to pray that certain things happen. If school shootings continue every week, then the kingdom hasn't come. Not only that, but Jesus prays a lot. He does. He's praying constantly. And Jesus acts a lot, too. Jesus doesn't just pray that hungry people will be fed. He feeds them. And he doesn't just pray that sick people will be healed. He heals them. And he doesn't pray that people who have been deceived will see the light. Or He doesn't only pray that. He goes and he teaches them. Jesus prays, and he does stuff too. And the Lord's prayer is structured in precisely this way. It is not a replacement for action in this world. It is a preparation for action. It's how we get ready to do what we need to do. How we meet God and try to listen for God's guidance, but then we take that guidance and act on it. If we find ourselves praying for something day in and day out, but never doing anything to help achieve it, then in a real sense, our prayer is not genuine. This doesn't mean that we can fix all the problems of our life alone, but rather that in prayer we're seeking to harmonize ourselves and coordinate, cooperate with God's will in the world. Prayer is not a replacement for action or an excuse to not act. It is preparation to act, inspired by the Spirit to do God's work in the world. And so if a politician has prayed 30 times for the victim's and their families of school shootings, but has never once done anything to prevent them, that prayer isn't really legitimate. That's the truth. That's what Jesus is teaching us. That's what we also need to hear for ourselves. Because as I said, we have gathered here today to pray. And we should pray. We'll pray today, and we'll pray next Sunday, and we'll pray every Sunday thereafter. And I hope that we're also praying not just on Sundays, right? Right? So let's pray, let's pray. But then, my friends, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, having heard God tell us what we need to do, having met God in that mysterious place, having prayed, let us then have the courage 
to do something. My friends, may it be so. Amen.